couple of years ago, I came across something really, really scary in the world of artificial intelligence, data, and analytics. In fact, the title of this talk, The Lies, the Racism, and the Sexism that are creeping into our algorithms today, are just symptoms of this issue that I'm going to be sharing with you. You see, when we think of the scary things of artificial intelligence, we tend to think of the machine becoming more and more human. But actually, the bigger problem is us, is that we are becoming more and more like the machine. In a sense, we're losing a big essence of our humanity. But don't get me wrong, I'm not here to bash artificial intelligence. It's, it's how I make my living, it's how I pay my kids' school fees. Right? And in fact, I've had the opportunity to use artificial intelligence for some really, really amazing social causes. We used algorithms to help connect people to causes that they cared about and managed to raise lots and lots of millions of pounds for charity. I've also had the pleasure of discussing with a really big law firm in West Africa that was trying to use artificial intelligence to help young, vulnerable girls who felt that they had to exchange sex to get the grades that they wanted at university and also artificial intelligence to help a school in Wales that was beginning trying to understand how they can reduce the number of children being excluded from school. And that's a huge problem, by the way, just as a small segue. These children, when excluded from school, have a significantly high propensity to commit suicide when they grow up or to end up in the prison system. So artificial intelligence can do many, many amazing things, not just commercially, but also socially. And I have the pleasure of having three wonderful children who all want to be Iron Man, right? They all love the world of artificial intelligence and the things that you can do with it. It makes our dinner conversations very interesting for me, but perhaps not for my wife. And I'll focus on the middle child who'll get his sunshine today. So he was putting together a presentation one day. He also loves PowerPoint. I don't know why that happened, but he was putting together a presentation one day after my sister gave birth to a little boy called Sankara. And he put this presentation together, and he came running into the room, and he said, Dad, Google doesn't know that cute babies could look like Sankara. I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, I just typed cute baby into Google, and not a single image looked like Sankara. So I took this, and I tried this at home. I tried this in a whole range of different places. And almost everywhere I got an opportunity to speak, I got people to type in cute baby and see if any black child showed up. Now, some of this might have changed recently. This was only a couple of years ago. This was in 2018. And it's not necessarily a new problem. Actually, a lot of people have done a lot of research, have written about it, um, have talked about it, all the way from as back as 2016, when Cathy O'Neill wrote her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. So it's not a new problem. But what really gets me is that the problem is still here today. And this should really bother you too, today. Only two weeks ago, guys, two weeks ago, Facebook issued a public apology. And that was because when certain users were watching a video of a black man, their recommendation engine suggested, would you like to see more videos on primates? That was two weeks ago. And the problem has been researched, and people know about it from as way back as 2016. So this is something we've got to try and figure out. How do we change this? And actually, changing, writing cute baby into Google or a recommendation engine from um, uh, Facebook, which was showing you a different uh, image or suggesting something like that, that can hurt. The problem is these biases have creeped into the algorithms that are used in every sphere of our lives today. Policing use it in facial recognition. It's used to determine housing. It's used, as we've seen also recently in the UK, uh, to determine the grades of certain students. It's used to determine who gets certain medical care and who doesn't. Some organizations are using artificial intelligence now in hiring process. And as I say, it's in every aspect of our lives, which means this can have devastating consequences on the individuals that the algorithm makes a certain decision about. I was driving one day, and uh, I was listening to something. It was a podcast, actually, and they talked about a really interesting scenario that took place in London. A young boy. 14 years old, in his school uniform, on his way home. And the police stopped him and arrested him straight away. 
And the reason why they arrested him is because their facial recognition algorithm had suggested that he matches a person that they'd been looking for, a criminal, a grown man criminal that they were looking for. He's 14, right? Research has shown that these algorithms that are in production and being used today have a high propensity of when they see a face like mine to match it with a criminal in the database. And it's more likely to happen to me than to perhaps some other individuals. Now think about the trauma that this boy was left with. 14 years old. What's going to do for his life as he continues to grow? It wasn't until they took the fingerprints and, measured, and checked them against the database that they realized he is not this grown criminal that they were looking for. 14 years old. Just think about the trauma that that will have on his life going forward. So someone issued me a challenge. They said, Mike, really? How can algorithms be racist, biased, or sexist? How can ones and zeros be racist, biased, and sexist? And it wasn't until recently I came up with a really, really good analogy that I could use to try and illustrate that problem. And I refer to two of my heroes, two old wise men that I think when you take some of the things they've said and join them together, you begin to get a clearer picture as to why this is happening. So we've got John McCarthy, who is the father of artificial intelligence. And when he coined the concept in the early days, one of the things he tried to understand is whether machines can learn to reason like human beings. And then Nelson Mandela, another hero of mine, had a very famous saying, which I'll paraphrase. He said, not a single human being is born hating somebody because of the color of their skin, because of their gender, or because of their religion. They have to learn it. They have to learn it. So, with John McCarthy talking about can machines learn to, be reason, to reason like humans, and Mandela saying you have to learn hate, that's what's happening with the machine. It's learning hate. And I'll give you an example, a real-life example of how that happens. I was invited to speak at a conference with some of the top CIOs and chief technology officers of some of the largest firms in the United Kingdom. And I got there, and this was the room. This is a real picture. I've blurred out their faces for obvious, obvious reasons. But in that room, there was one person of color, that was me. There was only one woman. Now consider this as a data set that you could give to an algorithm and say, use this data and try and find the next chief technology officer, the next great chief information officer. How many of you think the algorithm would actually select a woman? So Amazon got to experience this in real life, not so long ago. Right? So they developed an algorithm that would help them sift through a whole bunch of resumes to try and reduce the time it takes to look through hundreds of hundreds of resumes and select the top five. Okay? And that algorithm decided that it really liked men and was going to penalize women. In fact, any resume from a woman was rejected. Any resume from one who attended a women's academic institute was rejected. The algorithm went one step further, and if the resume just had the word woman in it, like women's chess team, it just said, uh-uh, computer says no. It rejected that as well. And I said these have life-impacting consequences. Consider your daughters. Consider your cousins, your aunts that are women, and the likelihood of them getting a job in technology, which, by the way, is the future. But if organizations are using algorithms that have this bias, they're going to get rejected as well. So let's look at the process of how the machine learns. It's a, it's a relatively complex process, but I can simplify it into three buckets. The first step is actually quite easy. Collect data. You need as much data as possible. And this is what the machine is going to use to learn. The second step is the very interesting step that I really want us to dig into a little bit. The second step is a process called exploration. This is where the data scientists would take that data, run some statistical algorithms over it to see if there are any anomalies, any biases, any things that he, needs to, he or she needs to clean from that data. And then once they've done that, they pass that on to the machine. So with those data scientists that had created some algorithms that tended to be racist and tended to be sexist and tended to be biased, I asked them, how did you not pick it up during your exploration phase? And there were two things that really stood out for me that really bring this problem home. Number one, they said, I run the stats, so the data looked okay. And number two, I didn't need to question it. 
Well, clearly they did because of what the algorithm ended up doing. But those are two points that they said. Now, here's the thing that really got me and it'll get you to. That is eerily similar to the way the machine looks at data. You see, for a machine, data is its lifeblood. They feed off it, they worship it. Anything that the, machine, the data says, the machine agrees with. But the saddest thing is that is exactly the way these individuals were behaving. And in fact, I shouldn't just blame them. It's happening to you and it's happening to me. We're developing this really unhealthy worship and approach to data, that whatever the data says, we listen to it. Think about the policeman in the example that I gave you earlier about that 14-year-old boy. 14-year-old boy on his way home from school. Blind faith in data is what the machine has. Blind faith in data is what these policemen experienced. Computer says you're a criminal, so I gotta hold you. I gotta take you, I gotta arrest you. Blind faith in data. This happens at scale, by the way. We're not exempt from this, this happens at scale. Consider the election in the US in 2016, when every algorithm, every poll suggested that Hillary Clinton would win by a landslide, right? And some Democrats believe that this faith in the data, this blind faith and blind belief in the data, is what resulted in some people thinking they didn't even need to show up for the election. They didn't even need to show up to vote. Blind faith in data. This is the scary thing that we need to look at as humans, you know, as people. And it's causing some really dangerous things that we've already talked about. So how do we help? How do we solve this problem? How do we help those data scientists when they're going through that data to try and make sure that they don't just not question it, but they actually ask the data some questions? I've got a really simple approach to addressing that. And it's just adding one thing. It's telling a story about that data. So when you do that exploration, also explain. Stories will transform the decisions they're making during this process. Stories have impacts on us that are so fundamental to the way we analyze and the way we process data. In fact, if there's a great quote by Daniel Kahneman, and he said, no one has ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. Look, the truth is, if we made decisions because of data, I would have a six pack because I would read the labels of all the sweets that I eat every single day but that's not what, how it works. I, the six pack is there, you just can't see it, all right? <laughs> I got told that yesterday. Um, but look, this is a really important issue. Stories are transformational. And I'm gonna show you exactly how this works. So there's three parts to a data story. The first thing you have to do is add some context. Context makes it relevant. It means something to you. Then you add some narrative because you want these data scientists to tell someone that story, right? And you want that story to be told in a way that everybody can understand it. So it makes it readable. That's what narrative does. Then you take the last step, which is a visual, right? A visual brings it to life. It makes it real. Now, a lot of the time when I speak to data scientists and I tell them about this process, first thing they say to me is, Mike, I'm a mathematician. I work with numbers. I'm not Shakespeare, I never studied English, I I'm not gonna write a story. And I'm like, hang on, and I'll show this to you guys. You don't need much, stories are inherent to us. We've been told stories since we were children. Stories is how we learn and stories is how we make decisions. Everybody has it within their gift to tell a story. And I will show you how easy it is and how powerful it will be. Let's look at data, let's actually apply it to some data and take two columns of data, right? Items sold and how much they cost. Baby shoes, 20 bucks. Raw data, right? Not so difficult for any of us. Now I'm gonna add a story, and you know what? I'm gonna even make the challenge even harder. I'm only going to use six words to tell the story on that data. And I'm gonna use a visual. Baby shoes for sale, $20, never worn. I'll say that again. Baby shoes for sale, $20, never worn. Your brain is doing something completely different to that data than it did when I just showed you baby shoes and $20. I've only used six words and told you a story, and your brain is asking questions. Remember those data scientists? They said they didn't even question the data. Right now, your brain is saying, never worn, why? 
what happened. You're asking questions of that data, right? So I'm going to tell you three amazing things that stories do to your brain when you tell them about data. So the first one is when you're sat in a lecture and, or in a meeting. Oh, I remember what it was like to sit in a lecture, right? And you get data and stats thrown at you. Only two parts of your brain light up, the, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. Only two parts of your brain light up. But when you tell a story, every single part of your brain just gets up and really energizes. You are able to connect the emotional side of your brain with the rational side of the brain. And that's how we make decisions, right? And even, it even impacts our memory. 3% of people will walk away from here remembering stats. 68% of people will remember the story. Has a massive impact, stories do. And the second thing is, stories create action. I've done some work in the charity space. And when you wrote a charity request or a solicitation for money um, or for donations, when you just wrote down the stats, 20 babies injured, you know, X amount of animals treated cruelly, versus when you told a story about Angela and the pain that she went through and the suffering that she's going through, you got way more donations. People act on the back of stories, whereas stats are just stale. And this is the essence of humanity that I'm talking about. The third thing that stories do that I absolutely love and is relevant to everything that we have talked about today is it brings people into the conversation. Now, one time I was on, we were on holiday with my family um, and we were visiting the Colosseum. And I have three amazing children, as I've said, but the problem is when you get to a place like that, one runs this way, one runs that way, the other one's that way, and you have that difficult decision as a parent, <laughs> Which child do I run after, right? So we decided to get a tour guide, Antonius. Antonius would walk us around while we stay in control of the children. Now, we're in the Colosseum. There's lots of other people there. We're consuming the same data that everybody else is. We're seeing the same things. The difference is we had Antonius. Antonius was telling us a story. And every time Antonius continued to tell that story, more and more people just sort of snuck along and followed us along. By the end of that, we had at least 11 people that were just blatantly following us everywhere we were going. But stories bring other people into the conversation. They are incredibly, incredibly powerful. So guys, we need to help make this change. And each one of you here has a responsibility. Each one of you here can contribute to solving some of these issues. And the first thing I'm asking is for any of you who are working with an analyst or a data scientist, just get them to tell the story. Tell, get them to tell someone the story of that data whilst they explore it. I guarantee you it will help them in the decisions that they make around that data, and they will change. The second request is for you in the audience, every single person here. Data is going to touch, and AI is going to touch every single part of your life. It already is. And every time you encounter data, ask for the story. Demand the story so you too can be brought into the conversation. Ask this for the story so that children who look like me aren't going to be fearful of being recognized by their AI as a potential criminal. Ask the story so that your daughters, your sisters, or yourselves won't be rejected by an algorithm because you're a woman looking for a tech job. Ask the story so that we can make a change. Thank you.